Well, good morning. This is Erin Winia at the League of Municipalities, and welcome to our community-led Broadband Basics webinar. Uh, we're really excited to have you all join us today. Um, I'm joined by one of my colleagues, Caitlin Saunders, uh, who is here with me for moral support, among other things. Um, and we are, we are both just uh, really grateful to you for giving your time today. What we're going to do is run through uh, a, a bunch of slides at the end of it, I will take questions, um, but probably not until the end of the webinar. So what you should see on your screen is a place for a, a question and answer box. Feel free to type in any questions as they come to you, um, and just know that I will address them at the end of the webinar. Uh, so that should be a, a pretty easy way for you to communicate anything that comes to your mind as we're going through this. Um, we are also going to be trying out some poll technology today. Um, want your participation and assistance with that. So have your smartphone nearby, uh, and we'll do a poll question pretty early here in the presentation to get everybody going. But uh, have your smartphone nearby so that you can participate in the poll as well. All right, well, we are going to get going here with uh, our broadband uh, uh, basics webinar, uh, the first thing to point out is that the League produced a, a report a few months ago called Leaping the Digital Divide, and you see information about that report on the screen right now. Uh, this report was co-authored. Um, I wrote parts of it. Uh, so did Joanne Hovis, who is a leading expert on municipal broadband. She's based in Washington, D.C., and she's with BTC Technology and Energy. She's a, a consultant, um, also an attorney, but works as a, a private consultant and not as an attorney. Um, if any of you all get to, to meet with Joanne, you'll understand uh, just how wonderful um, and knowledgeable she is about this area. We are also lucky to work with Blair Levin from the Brookings Institution. Uh, he wrote a foreword to this report, and if you've not read the report yet, uh, I encourage you to do so. It's available at the League's website, which is www.nclm.org backslash broadband. Once you're there, you'll be able to see the report. Um, so that's nclm.org backslash broadband. Uh, but Blair Levin, he actually is a native North Carolinian, um, graduate of the UNC Law School, and he also has worked with local governments um, as well as at the FCC uh, for many, many years. Um, he is uh, truly a champion of community-led broadband and I think wrote a really fantastic, very relevant to North Carolina uh, forward for our report. So commend that to you as well. Uh, what we're going to do in this particular presentation today is basically take important points from that report and kind of expand on them a little bit and hopefully educate you a little bit more uh, about uh, the terminology that we use when we talk about broadband, um, also the types of technology that you might encounter as you're learning about this issue and trying to figure out uh, if you can get something going in your community. Uh, we will definitely focus a little bit on a policy proposal for partnerships. We'll describe some of the legal landscape here in North Carolina today. Uh, and then we'll switch to the role of local leaders, what you all can do as local leaders to help lead a community broadband effort. And at the end, we'll provide some resources on the last slide. Um, there are many, many good resources in this area, uh, including many within this state. So we want to make sure you leave knowing where you can turn uh, to get some of your questions answered and kind of give you some direction on where to go. So with that, we are going to start off with a poll question. So the first thing I would like you all to do is to take out your smartphone. And you can either join the poll by text or by using your web browser. So two different ways to enter the poll. And it couldn't be simpler. If you're using text, go ahead and get a new message up and the the place that you're going to text is the number 22333 and in the body of the message type in nclm staff once you send that message you'll get a confirmation response and it'll indicate that you've joined the poll uh, it'll also tell you that at the very end of the poll which will be at the end of this presentation if you just type leave then you'll exit the poll uh, you can also go and use your web browser. If you do that, 
get it to or navigate to pollev.com backslash NCLM staff, and that will also get you to the poll. So these instructions are going to, we're going to have six different poll questions throughout the presentation today, and these instructions will appear at the top of each poll question. So don't worry if you didn't get it right now, but I'm going to move on to the first poll question. Uh, and that is, and it's interesting to me how it's displaying here, y'all. This is the first time that I've um, I've used this uh, technology in a in a presentation. And at least on my screen, it looks like it's probably maximized a little further than um, than I would want it to. But you can see the question, and the question we're asking you to answer is, how many North Carolinians lack broadband? So go ahead and type in your answer. It's either A, B, C, or D. A, if you think 1.1 million North Carolinians lack broadband. B, if you think it's 860,000. C, if you think it's 475,000. Or D, if you think it's 640,000. So again, this is the number of North Carolinians that lack broadband. Now I'm going to fiddle with this presentation for just a second to see if we can actually see the full uh, poll question here. I, I know it's a little... A little more clunky, but now you can at least see the full poll. And I think I probably messed up the poll a little bit. Well, there we go. All right, so we'll give it just another moment since I was fiddling with it to uh, text in or type into your web browser the answer. And then, So the correct answer is D, 640,000 North Carolinians who lack broadband. Uh, so it's definitely a big number, maybe not quite as big as what a lot of folks thought, but certainly uh, a, a concerning number all the same. And I bet a lot of you would say those North Carolinians are in the communities that you live in. So what we need to do is figure out what is broadband. Um, so that may have helped you answer the question if you knew what we were talking about. Uh, you can measure broadband in several different ways, either by the type of the technology or uh, the internet speed, the speed at which data is transferred um, from one computer to another or one device to another. Uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, has chosen to define broadband by speed. And the speed that they selected is 25 over 3 megabits per second. And I'm going to break that down for you in just a moment. But just know that when we're talking about broadband, generally we're talking about a speed at which data can be delivered, not the type of technology that's being used. So how you describe Internet speed. I just said that I was going to break down that 25-3 standard for you. The first thing to understand is that it's measured in megabits, and these are uh, just a, um, uh, a unit of measurement, uh, uh, of measuring data. You also have two different numbers there. So they refer to the download or upload speed. The first number is the download. Uh, so that's the amount of uh, uh, time it would take um, or the speed with which, sorry, that it would take for a piece of data to be downloaded to the device that you're using. That's usually much faster than upload speeds. Of course, you use uploads when you're trying to transfer files. A lot of businesses use that. You know, if you have a, a particularly large file, let's say it's an engineer or an architect designed a set of plans, they need to upload that uh, before it can be sent to a client. Um, but historically, upload speeds had not been emphasized um, in, by users. And so uh, the, the technology has been uh, designed at this point to favor quicker download speeds. Um, but that was a conscious engineering decision that was made in the industry. Um, it may not make as much sense nowadays, uh, depending on how we use internet. So that's why there's a lot of focus on gigabit. Speeds. Gigabits are, uh, one gigabit is a thousand megabits. And when we say that the speeds are symmetrical with gigabit, that means it is the same download and upload. These are very fast speeds if you get gigabit service. So uh, this map is where the 640,000 uh, people who lack broadband, where that figure came from. And it came from the Federal Communications 
Commission and their data. Uh, so this map was created uh, by a North Carolina agency. I don't know if uh, many of you all know that we have a broadband infrastructure office, but we do. It's a relatively new state agency, um, and it is currently housed within our Department of Information Technology. And uh, it's the, the staff of the NCBIO, it would be the abbreviation for that agency, are just fantastic. And if you've not worked with them yet, um, hopefully you will in the future. They uh, know how to do community-led broadband. They actually have a big effort underway right now that uh, is trying to uh, put tips out there so that you kind of understand more about what to do. But they can help walk you through getting a plan for community-led broadband. But they put together this map based on FCC data. The problem with this map, so you'll see the green areas are where companies are reporting speeds of broadband speeds of 25 up, sorry, 25 down, three up. Uh, that's that FCC minimum threshold. The problem with it is that the FCC data is largely inaccurate. Um, and it has the effect of understating the level of service that's out there. Because I bet some of you are looking at this map and thinking, gosh, it looks like we have broadband speeds that are pretty fast uh, in my community, but I don't know where that happens. Here's why. So the FCC allows the private internet service providers to report their data uh, by census block. And so when they do that, they say, if a parcel in that census block is able to be served at whatever speed is being reported, you can count the entire census block as served. Uh, especially in rural areas where you have very large census blocks and often very spotty uh, broadband service, that leads to inflating the numbers uh, and then therefore understating the actual level of service that's out there. So uh, just something to be aware of, we don't really have good data uh, to measure where broadband service actually is being uh, provided in, in the state as well as across the country. This isn't something that's unique in North Carolina. Um, some other key terms that are important to understand have to do with broadband infrastructure. So the first distinction would be between middle mile and last mile. So uh, for those of you who are in local government and are pretty familiar with water systems, I'm gonna make an analogy to our water infrastructure right now. So middle mile is the part of the broadband infrastructure that would be kind of like a trunk line for a water line. It's the, the bigger one that's carrying much more water or data in the case of broadband. Uh, and then the last mile connections are the, the offshoots. So it would be uh, in the water world, it would be the laterals coming off of the trunk line that actually serve a home or a business or a, a, say a manufacturing facility or, or an institution. Um, last mile connections for broadband are the same. They're, they're the ones that actually take the broadband service directly into a premises. Dark fiber and lit fiber, this is another type of terminology you hear a lot in these types of broadband discussions. Dark fiber simply means that the actual fiber optic cables are not transmitting data, they are dark. So the way fiber optic cables work is they uh, transmit data by using light pulses. And so when they're being used, because there are light pulses going, they say that the fiber is lit. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, but dark fiber simply means it's dormant, it's an asset that's out there, but it's not being used. Backhaul is required in every broadband um, type of technology. It is the kind of back end um, equipment that's needed to make sure that the data can be transmitted through whatever technology is being used, whether it's fiber or cable or something else. So backhaul often is going to be electronics, um, it can be the power source that, uh, that powers the electronics, but once the electronics are, are connected to the actual um, data delivery medium, again, that could be fiber, it could be cable, uh, all together they call that backhaul. Conduit is just what you think. It's an empty uh, pipe, essentially, that you would lay fiber uh, through, and that's if you're putting it underground, it protects the fiber. Um, it could also protect cable, I think, if cable is buried underground as well. 
Finally, there's a distinction between wireless and Wi-Fi. Uh, and I'm not gonna get too techy on you here, guys, but uh, Wi-Fi is essentially a subset of protocols that are wireless protocols. There are other types of wireless protocols as well. So Wi-Fi is a subset of a broader type of wireless um, technology that's out there. So these are important distinctions to keep in mind when you're talking about broadband. All right, it's time for another poll, guys. And again, I'm sorry this uh, slide is displaying a little strangely. Uh, we will definitely fix this before we use poll EV uh, for our next presentation. But the simple yes or no question, does your city own fiber? Yes, if, if, you, if you do own fiber, then type in A. If you don't, type in B. And I'm gonna go ahead and presume that <laughs> If we can't see the number displayed, it's probably split just about evenly. But I'll give you a few more seconds here to type in an answer about whether your city owns fiber. So now that we know what fiber is, maybe you have a good sense of that. So it looks like uh, there's a nearly 50-50 split here with the folks who are on uh, participating in this webinar today. Few more say they have fiber than not. Um, so that's helpful to note. So there definitely is broadband infrastructure being utilized in local governments right now. I think that's the big point here. So what is fiber? Uh, I already described that it's, it's a technology that allows the transfer of data using light pulses. We say it's future proof. And the reason for that is because this is an asset that is going to be necessary for the long haul, for generations. Part of that is because it has enormous bandwidth, it can provide data transmission at symmetrical speeds, and it's not subject to some other types of limitations that you see with other types of broadband delivery technology. So for example, it's not subject to interference from weather. Uh, that could be wind, uh, rain, these kinds of disruptive weather events. Um, interference can also come from trees or buildings that block a signal. Uh, fiber doesn't have that limitation. You don't have to have electronics that amplify a signal through fiber either. Uh, so that's another advantage to fiber. And it doesn't corrode. Uh, these are all improvements over previous generations of technology. And again, this is the type of technology that once the investment has been made in it, it will run for generations. So it is future proof. Here's where uh, based on, again, that kind of faulty FCC data, but where we believe fiber is available in North Carolina. And the, the part of this map to focus on is the red. Um, the red areas right now are where the providers are reporting they have fiber in the ground and that's what's being used to deliver broadband services. So you can tell that it's largely, though not exclusively, but largely in our urban areas of the state. Again, this is probably not the most accurate map because it is based on that FCC data that uh, we've already discussed is um, not incredibly accurate. Uh, but it is some of the most recent data that's available. It was released just last November to create this map. There are other types of technology though that you've probably um, heard about for broadband delivery. Cable remains actually right now the primary way that broadband is provided in the United States. Really the reason is because it is reasonably well suited uh, to, to these types of uses, but it's also, it's just everywhere. So what cable providers have done is they've taken that massive infrastructure investment that they've made over decades across the country and they've retrofitted it to, do, uh, to provide broadband services. It does have larger bandwidth than all other technologies except for fiber though it is still limited, there are limitations for cable. They can upgrade to some extent by uh, installing new electronics on the back end, so their backhaul, they can upgrade and they should be able to squeeze out uh, even faster speeds than we see today. Um, but nobody thinks that cable will be able to keep up with fiber for the long haul. The other big limitation for cable is what we'll call rush hour slowdowns. Uh, that's when um, everybody gets home from work, and they all wanna either turn on the TV to catch the news or maybe they're turning it on to stream Netflix or, or some kind of movies. Um, but once you get a lot of users using the limited bandwidth that cable can offer, it all slows down. 
Um, and so that, that is a big limitation. So the advertised speeds are often not what they're delivering because advertised speeds, of course, are going to be um, when there's no rush hour. DSL has been used to provide broadband in many communities for the same reason that cable has, because it's ubiquitous. Um, this is the copper phone lines that in some cases were installed over a century ago. They are very old technology, even for voice and voice alone. They are, many of these copper phone lines are probably at the end of their useful lifespan. So that's why even though they're ubiquitous, we say that this is obsolete um, from, a, from a broadband uh, perspective and you do see in the in the private sector right now a lot of uh, almost abandoning of DSL lines for both voice and broadband applications it's extremely limited bandwidth it is subject to interference and the signal loss happens because the signal degrades uh, the further you get from the central point where the data was was sent and we're talking about you know maybe a maximum of 2,000 feet uh, that you could have a signal go over a copper phone line. So they, the further you get away from it, the worse the signal is and the harder it is to transmit data using this particular technology. Uh, it's not one we would ever recommend um, a community broadband effort looking to uh, in terms of uh, if you're gonna be making that investment, you probably wanna uh, put it into a technology that's a bit more capable and modern. So. Here's our third poll question. So everybody grab your phone again. We are curious to see if you know how many North Carolinians without broadband live in rural areas. And you've got three answer choices here. If you think it's 75% of North Carolinians without broadband living in rural areas, type in A. If you think it's 85%, type in B. And if you think it's 95%, type in C. And we'll give this a few seconds for folks to get Get your phones back up and type in your answer. All right. Well, it looks like the runaway choice here, people think it's 85% of North Carolinians without broadband living in rural areas. And again, we're using these FCC maps and their definition of broadband. The actual answer is 95%. Uh, so for the 14% of you who guessed C, 95%, you got the right answer for this one. There are other types of technology that are often suggested as solutions, primarily in rural areas, uh, to try to deliver broadband. And the reason why these are suggested is because, as you know, when you have more sparsely populated areas uh, that are geographically spread out, it's harder to make a good business case for making the expensive investments that you need to for some of these technologies. It's why we, we see the lack of broadband service in these areas to begin with. Um, it's not something the private sector can sustain under its business model, and that's totally understandable. Uh, no fault of the private sector there, it's just that's reality. It's, they can't make the math work. So fixed wireless is one type of technology that's often touted um, as a good solution, particularly in, in these areas where uh, they're low density areas. Uh, it would be a last mile solution. So what happens is antennas are mounted on some base station that's located near a customer. Um, so it would probably have to be on some sort of tower or a building, um, a really tall pole, something like that. They put the antenna up there, it beams out a wireless signal, which then is received by the customer. Um, there are some downsides to this technology, uh, and when, when I list them, you'll probably realize that this is going to work most well uh, in areas of the state that are, that are flat, that don't have a lot of geographic challenges. So outside of limited bandwidth, which you would expect because it's a wireless technology, uh, this technology, just like cable, is subjected to rush hour slowdown. It also needs a line of sight to function. So interference is a real issue with fixed wireless. Um, it's something that presents an engineering challenge uh, when systems are being designed. Uh, and so it's just something to keep in mind, especially if you live in an area with a lot of trees or buildings or hills, um, mountains, fixed wireless uh, does become a more challenging solution. So we have a chart here on this slide that is just, um, one that's useful to keep in mind, it, it compares all these technologies that I just walked through 
uh, with those factors that, that could affect um, whether you think they're a good investment or not as you're considering broadband for your community. There are obviously other factors as well. I haven't even addressed financial um, implications here, uh, but it's just these are, these are things to keep in mind and to understand when you're evaluating technology. So there are wireless technologies as well, and I'll take just a moment to walk through them for you really fast. First, we have 3G and 4G LTE. These are uh, mobile broadband technologies. I think all of us are probably very familiar with these if we have cell phones now. They've been running these technologies probably for close to a decade. Um, it is currently the platform that most mobile services are provided off of. Depending on the level of broadband service where a customer is, these mobile solutions can be faster. Uh, especially than, than residential speeds that are delivered by the other technologies I just went through. Um, I, I would say some of those technologies, fiber would not be one of those. So these mobile broadband um, uh, protocols are severely limited on their upload speeds. And all you have to think about is whether a kid today could do homework using their mobile phone. Um, it probably is just not going to be possible due to the fact that they, they need to use um, software uh, and they need to upload some of their their homework and whatnot wireless as we all know can uh, sometimes not be very reliable and it is expensive to have these plans and they're often subject to data caps so when you're talking about mobile broadband solutions uh, these are all certainly factors to consider as you're evaluating them one thing we're curious about though and here's your next poll question is if your community has a small cell wireless facility or multiple small cell wireless facilities. And I will tell you what that is after this slide, but go ahead and, and get your phones out and answer this poll. A for yes, B for no, C for huh. Um, I understand this is a new thing and, you, and it's not something everybody knows about just yet. Does your community have small cell wireless facilities? So you can see the trends going here, folks, and it looks like, by and large, communities uh, that the call that the participants today are from either don't have small cell wireless facilities, or we're still a little, little unclear about what I'm talking about. So let's go to the next slide and figure this out. Small cell facilities have are a recent technological innovation in the mobile broadband business. Uh, the, the small part of the, the word really refers not to the size of these facilities, because they can actually be quite large, as you can see in the photos here, but rather the distance that the signal can travel. It's a small distance. They use high frequencies, uh, and the, the signal, we're told, can only go three to 400 yards. And that means for a mobile broadband system that's running off of small cells, for it to work, those antennas have to go every three to 400 uh, yards. And so that's pretty close together. Uh, they also work better the closer to the ground they are. And so there's been a lot of discussion recently about mounting these antennas and then their backhaul equipment. And you can see the backhaul equipment in the middle picture here. That's just one example. Um, sometimes it's mounted onto a pole, but sometimes it's on the ground. They do look like equipment boxes. And there's been a lot of discussion, especially in urban areas, about uh, what these look like and where they go, and um, does the community have a role to play in where, where these uh, facilities get sited. Of course, there are engineering concerns as well and public safety concerns, and all of that was actually subject to a very extensive negotiation at our state legislature and many other state legislatures across the country just last year. Um, we're not here to talk about that today, but I just flagged that for you, that if you're more curious about small cell, um, you and I can talk afterwards about that. But part of what's going on is, as part of that technology being developed, the wireless industry is promoting it uh, as a way to deliver 5G services. So this would be the next generation of mobile broadband. Right now, it's just a marketing term. There are no standards for 5G just yet. Uh, but uh, what, what you do need to understand is, at least for right now, when these facilities are being installed, they are primarily to boost the 3G and 4G LTE signals that are already out there. 
You have to wait for standards to be developed before we'll ever see 5G. And then on top of that, everybody's devices also have to be equipped to handle those standards. And because we don't have standards yet, there are no devices that can run 5G. So it's all pretty theoretical at this point. Uh, it's largely going to take place in urban areas, uh, which is why you saw in the poll question, not a lot of people have these in their communities just yet. An important thing to understand, though, about this mobile broadband uh, technology, as well as most others, most others, is that the antennas receive their data signals from fiber. And so there is an investment that these wireless companies are making in the actual antennas and their backhaul, but they also are going to have to be connected into fiber to work. And that means fiber has to be laid somewhere nearby. That is a pretty expensive proposition. And that is the reason why you're not likely to see this solution in rural areas. So if I can get this to work here, we're gonna watch a video really fast called Why a Gig? And hopefully this will come up and play easily. We get questions all the time asking us to help people respond to claims that no one really needs a gig. For those moments, he is our own Christopher Mitchell. Break it down. The essential infrastructure, you know, like roads and bridges and electricity and that sort of thing, they're built with the future in mind. It's a bewildering future, all right. They meet our immediate needs now because we've planned for that extra capacity. When I want to use my toaster, I don't have to worry about blowing a fuse. I don't turn off the lights. And I don't unplug my fridge. There's more electricity that's flowing into my house than I can use at any given time. And that's how our networks will work in the future. And in fact, you know, they already work that way in Wilson in North Carolina, in Cedar Falls, Iowa, Sandy, Oregon. And the, the big cable and, and the telephone companies, they might ask, what application could possibly justify a gig? But that's not how we should think about infrastructure. A single car or truck doesn't need a three-lane highway. No vehicle is three lanes wide. The highways, they're designed for traffic, many different vehicles. They have to accommodate these different vehicles at the same time. And it's the same thing with our internet infrastructure. No one application needs a gigabit network. But households already have many connected devices, computers, and smartphones, tablets, game consoles, lots of other things. And each year we get new and better devices. And they all demand connectivity. And next year they're going to demand more connectivity. You remember the world with dial-up access? We couldn't stream video. And now that our connectivity is better, streaming video is just a part of life. Our applications get better as our networks get better. It's a sort of chicken and egg problem. But the fact is, we actually need robust infrastructure to have that kind of innovation to begin with. Fast movers like Chattanooga. Oh, pardon me, boy. Yeah, yeah. Is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? The Chattanooga choo-choo. On track 29. They're seeing an influx of entrepreneurs. Now, the big cable and telephone companies are all like, okay, all right, all right, here's a gig. But a gig ain't a gig when the upload is 90 or even 97% slower. That's what the big cable guys are doing in particular. They're pretending to offer a gig. We, we shouldn't accept that. We need to be able to produce big things. And that means we need to upload big things with cloud services and iPhones recording in 4K video. And we need fast upload speeds. And for that, we need fiber and we need high capacity wireless networks. Frankly, most of us can get by just fine with a 100 megabit symmetrical connection. But the cost to build that network, they're basically the same as building a gig. So let's think bigger. Don't be fooled. Oh, you know, here's a little something extra for our fellow geeks. You know, engineers, they understand that you're not going to run a gig application on a gig network. That's because there's just no headroom. The time that you want to add capacity to a network, it's not when the network is really full at 99% capacity. It's really much earlier than that. And, and that's because when you start dealing with congestion, what happens is the network starts dropping packets, and then you have to retransmit the same information over and over again, and you get even more congestion. It just, it's a self-reinforcing cycle. Think about it this way. When you're at your local bar and it starts to get busy, you have to start saying the same thing twice, but louder, so that the person next to you can hear them. The whole bar starts getting noisier and noisier, as everyone has to talk over the top of each other. No one can communicate. 
Or to take a different example, uh, the interstate. It, it flows really well when it's far below the maximum number of cars that you can park on it. Uh, you know, you, you, as you add more cars to it, basically, it just gets more and more congested until everyone's stuck. It's the same way that networks just work better when you're not at full capacity. And that's why we need a gig. All right, everybody. Let's get the presentation back up here. So hopefully that provided a good explanation, um, pretty clear explanation for why we should really be, uh, if you're thinking about making investments in broadband infrastructure, thinking about it for the long term and the types of speeds that will be needed in the future. So one policy suggestion that the League made in this report, Leaping the Digital Divide, is for public-private partnerships uh, to be enabled through our General Assembly. Uh, we think that this is actually a model that we've seen across the, the country that could work very well here in North Carolina. And frankly, due to a lot of the factors that we've kind of been dancing around through this webinar, uh, it is likely going to be the primary way that broadband infrastructure gets built out to these more hard to reach places in our state. So why would you choose a public-private partnership? Well, for starters, when you're talking about broadband service, you actually have a revenue stream. And that's key because guys, we're just adding numbers together and trying to make the math work to make sure that you can justify the cost of the investment uh, based on uh, the service that gets provided by using it. So the numbers do have to work for both the public sector and the private sector. If you have a revenue stream from customers, that helps tremendously. We're also talking about a situation where the cost of building infrastructure is high. Um, I think we can all acknowledge that it's a big investment and that's why it's a big challenge. In many cases, the public partner may lack the expertise to operate the system and serve the customers. I will say that public uh, actors, though, are generally very good at building uh, the infrastructure investment, and that's something that is historic. Uh, public entities have built roads for generations, built electric systems and water systems. Public entities do historically invest in, in, in big infrastructure that has a long lifespan and has wide community benefits, and certainly broadband fits that model uh, to a T. You also may look to public-private partnerships uh, when there's a desire to serve areas that are otherwise unprofitable. Um, this is a way to help achieve that goal. That's, that's what the public partner would bring uh, to the equation. Uh, and, and we capture that in terms of talking about digital inclusion. Uh, this is so that everybody has access to these types of digital communications. Uh, and that may not necessarily be a goal of the private sector right now. So you look to these public-private partnerships to try to achieve all of these different, uh, both financial as well as community benefit goals. There are uh, several different types of partners that uh, we see in other places across the country that could enter these partnerships. And it could be more than just two partners, guys. Um, these, are, these are often very creatively done. So certainly the private provider is an internet service provider or an ISP. Uh, and then the public partners could be either cities or counties, you know, these units of local government. They could also be schools, colleges, and universities. The nonprofit partners that you often see in many of these partnerships include electric and telephone cooperatives. Uh, and think for a moment about why they would be really important in this uh, particular type of partnership. They often, or not often, they do own the poles, as well as often they have easements or rights to use the right-of-way for this purpose. Uh, that takes care of an incredible amount of the cost and investment right off the bat when you have existing assets that can be used to either string fiber between poles or bury it uh, underground in an easement uh, that's already held by an electric or telephone cooperative. The co-ops are also often in our rural areas, so they're, they're a pretty natural way uh, to get broadband deployed uh, to these hard to reach areas. MCNC is a nonprofit based here in North Carolina, and it's only in North Carolina, uh, that was started back in 1982 by former Governor Jim Hunt. And they have made, uh, they've received 
dollars from the federal government, um, among other sources, and have made really significant investments in building a middle mile backbone across the state. There's a northern route and a southern route, and you often, uh, when you talk to private internet service providers, you hear them saying that they look for where MCNC's investments have been made uh, to see if they can build off of that middle mile investment uh, for their own last mile service that they want to provide. So MCNC is a terrific partner and they are um, really at the cutting edge of what's been going on across the country. There are others as well who are nonprofit partners. But some of the features of a partnership, I mean, when you think about this, what you're really doing is, is it's a device, it's a method of allocating risk, benefit, and control. So the risk, of course, is the risk that something, uh, that that revenue stream is going to be there once you build it. The more risk you take, and usually that's going to be financial risk, the more benefit will come uh, to that party on the back end. Um, the more risk you assume, you also get more control over where the service gets provided or whatever other goals you hope to achieve uh, through this partnership. The more you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. So that's, that's kind of a, a basis of any kind of partnership, um, but a public-private partnership for sure. So there's going to be different arrangements for each partnership, and it really will depend on your local circumstances uh, and your local customer base. So there are three different types of models uh, for public-private partnerships that the report walks through. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but we wanted to include them in the presentation so that you had this here. The first model is kind of, uh, we, we like to think of it as the model that has the least amount of risk for the public entity. It's called public facilitation of private investment. So you'll notice there, there's not much public investment going on. Really what the public partner is doing in this type of partnership uh, is contributing in other ways. They might be staff who can assist with the deployment that the private sector is doing and smooth the local permitting process. Uh, the public partner can also contribute maybe economic incentives, uh, but really in this model, the private partner is the one taking on most of the risk. They are building the network, they are deciding who gets served and at what cost. So uh, very minimal public involvement on this end of the spectrum. Uh, in the middle is a concessionaire model. This is actually the, the type of public-private partnership that most of us are probably familiar with because it's very similar to a typical, uh, like a toll road, that type of uh, public-private partnership. And P3 is a way to abbreviate public-private partnerships. So I may just, for the rest of this presentation, start calling them P3. In this model, the concessionaire model, the public private, or sorry, the public partner provides money over time. So it's not all provided at once. It might be annual payments over a period of time. And then in return, they grant a concession to the private partner to build and operate a system, usually under some sort of lease arrangement. So the public partner actually is financing uh, and, and building this infrastructure. The private partner in these types of partnerships then is, is leasing it. There's an example in Huntsville, Alabama of this type of model, and they partnered with Google Fiber. Huntsville, I will say, also had its own electric system, and that definitely made it attractive for Google. It cut down a lot on the cost for that partnership. The final model that we see across the country is one that's called shared investment and risk. And this is really uh, where each partner can bring financial resources to the table, and each partner, therefore, is assuming some risk. Uh, for the success of this system. Right now, we see this type of model really only being successful in urban areas where you have a large customer base, but that's not to say it won't mature as time goes on uh, and be, be something that we see more frequently uh, in less dense areas. So, I've got one more video for you here, and this is a short one that uh, just kind of brings all that we've been talking about together. It was produced by a group called North Carolina Broadband Matters, and let me see if I can get this up. It's just a great overview of community-led broadband. Uh, so as soon as this loads, we will get it going. North Carolina has a long history of technological leadership. Consistent investments in infrastructure from roadways and railroads led to flourishing industries within the state. Information technology to banking to biotech, these industries prospered because of North Carolina's commitment to connectivity. Today, a different form of infrastructure drives competitiveness and defines sustainable community development. High-speed broadband internet, 
we are now an internet-dependent economy where opportunity is deeply tied to availability and access. It may be hard to believe, but some communities in North Carolina don't have access to a modern broadband connection. The reliable user-collected data shows the gap we must work to fill together. This is why our communities are organizing. We are mobilizing. We are learning from one another to make the gigabit fiber connection. North Carolina broadband matters now. It's going to require more of the strategic partnerships between the state level, the regional level, and the local level in order to reach the most communities, the maximum amount of people that we can as efficiently as possible. Broadband connected schools, Wi-Fi on buses, and digital learning tools make access to education more equitable. We felt the need to go to a one-to-one -one digital environment for our students. We chose that because students who did not have internet at home could download that information, take it home, work on it offline, and come back. It would be so powerful if they also had the internet at home, but we've been able to try to bridge that gap in some way. I see internet-connected co-working spaces and innovation centers restore local competitiveness by building strong communities of producers, entrepreneurs, small businesses, and emerging industries. Telehealth centers in rural North Carolina connect patients to their providers and transform the delivery of quality care. If someone has a cable box or someone is used to having some sort of a device like a TV in their house, accessing telehealth is very similar to that, where you know, they can just kind of walk by several times a day, uh, put their fingers on, uh, on a box and measure their blood pressure, their heart rate, and that goes back to their physician. It really changes the way uh, physicians can interact with their patients, not just every three months or every six months, but daily if you wanted to. A thousand megabits per second is the technical description of a gigabit, but we all know the real value is not having to have your employees wait while large files are being uploaded. Uh, in the business world, this could be an orthodontist that's uploading an imaging file to Invisalign, and it might take 40 minutes with a regular internet connection, but with gigabit, it can happen in less than a minute. I think that's a paradigm shift of, you know, generations ago saying, what if everybody had running water? What if everybody had sewer and plumbing? What if everybody had electricity? What if everybody had high-speed internet? Better broadband is our most promising and powerful tool for addressing the inequalities that characterize the perceived divide between our rural and urban communities. High-speed broadband infrastructure everywhere. Everyone in North Carolina taking part in the high-speed internet future. NC Broadband Matters. NC Broadband Matters. NC Broadband Matters. And that's why NC Hearts Gigabit. Okay. So I want to spend just a moment here. Now that we've got everybody all excited and ready to go out and uh, do your own community organizing and just remind you of where we are legally in North Carolina. There is different law for cities and for counties uh, when it comes to uh, what you can do to uh, either build or incentivize broadband infrastructure. And I think it's fair to say that the law is certainly gray right now. We need clarity in that law uh, so that everybody, uh, all these public partners have the absolute authority necessary uh, to enter into these partnerships. And I think, you know, from the private sector's perspective too, this is important so that they understand and have some reassurance that the local government is uh, authorized legally to undertake the activities that they're promising to do in any kind of partnership. So we'll go through that in just a moment, but we also wanna note that our electric co-ops in this state also do likely need some statutory changes for them to really participate as full-fledged partners as well. So from the, the municipal perspective, our report recommends explicit authority in our state statutes uh, to do the following, to raise money for broadband infrastructure. And by raise money, we mean either through taxation or from borrowing. Explicit authority, secondly, to spend that money on broadband infrastructure. And then finally, explicit authority to lease infrastructure to the private or nonprofit entities that would operate and profit from using that infrastructure. So that's what our report calls for. We think if those three areas of the law are clarified, then you'll see a pretty widespread adoption of these partnerships and uh, have lots of broadband um, activity going on in areas of the state where you don't see it now. So this is one of the last uh, poll questions I've got. I think it's the next to last one. 
North Carolina City, so we're talking just cities here, guys. This is quizzing your knowledge of our current state law. North Carolina cities may provide which of the following services over city-owned broadband infrastructure? Can they provide internal communications, remote meter reading, free internet to the public, or all of the above? What does our law currently allow for North Carolina cities? And again, this is just cities, so for those of you on the call who are from counties, I'm sorry, uh, there is no, no equivalent state statute applying to counties. And we'll give it just another moment to see what people think about this one. And it looks like the overwhelming uh, consensus here is D, all of the above. And that is true. Cities currently have the authority for any city-owned broadband infrastructure to be used for the, the, all the purposes on this slide. Internal communications, of course, are like your public safety communications. It could be traffic signalization. Remote meter reading, that can be for water or electric meters. Free uh, internet to the public, like downtown Wi-Fi, that is all perfectly legal for cities right now under North Carolina state law. So there are some strategies that uh, local governments can also undertake without needing any sort of additional clarity from the North Carolina General Assembly. You can certainly work now to streamline permitting, um, and that can accelerate these ISPs' access to right-of-way within the city. So just speeding up permitting at the local level. Uh, if you've got a high volume of uh, private building taking place for broadband, pre-qualifying third-party inspectors to inspect that work um, before it gets to be a crunch time, that can be a, an attractive benefit that the, the public sector can provide. Publishing useful data. If you know where fiber assets are currently located in your community, you can provide that GIS data to a private provider. Uh, it's definitely useful for them. Performing timely, accurate water and sewer locates uh, so that those are marked in a timely way. Offering space in government buildings. And then this one is really important, recruiting customers. That's something that doesn't cost a local community anything, but it has big bang for the buck because remember, these private companies, these private ISPs are trying to make the math work and they need a revenue stream. If you can come to them with community leaders at your side from various businesses saying, I will sign up for your service if it's delivered, that's really powerful. Um, especially if those community leaders are part of your anchor institutions in your community, whether those are uh, hospitals or healthcare services, educational uh, institutions, um, or, or even just big business and manufacturing presence. Uh, that's a really important uh, role for a local leader to play. The General Assembly also could authorize a host of other policies. I'm not going to go through these in any kind of detail right now, except to say that there is a lot of thought that's been given to this and a lot that can be done if our state leaders have uh, want to make those policy decisions. They certainly could. And our report notes all of the ones that are listed on the slide here. So what can you as a local leader do to try to lead a, a community-led broadband uh, effort in your community? The first thing you've got to do is do your homework. Learn the issue, know the key terminology that you'll need to use to have these discussions, uh, and seek out experts to help you with this. Um, there are lots of them out there, uh, and, and they, I think, are all very dedicated to this concept of bringing broadband to everybody, and they, they want to help communities make this work. Knowing, at the same time, the limitations of our state law is something that's important to keep in mind. Uh, and like I said, it is gray right now. It would help if the General Assembly gave us some clarity on that point. Also, uh, and I just spoke about this on the previous slide, inventorying your locally owned assets. So this could be uh, providing, uh, if you know where fiber on the ground is, providing it in a GIS map, but also uh, knowing you know, where other types of assets are, whether they're towers or tall buildings that would be suitable for uh, locating antennas, let's say. All of that can be done in advance uh, as you're trying to organize a community-led broadband effort. But ultimately, and, and this is a big lift, guys, and I understand this, but uh, this, is, this is a really large uh, infrastructure problem that we are all collectively trying to solve. And right now it's being left largely to the private sector. 
if as public officials you want to get involved, you'll have to help build the business case. You'll have to lead a community effort, and that means identifying community partners, whether those are these business leaders and institutional leaders I just mentioned, whether they're uh, neighborhood leaders, you know, on the residential side. Mapping the service area, identifying where funding is. Uh, a lot of that right now is, is available outside of the state, not necessarily inside the state of North Carolina. Soliciting private partners. And it, those private partners could be the, the big ones that you've heard about, AT&T, Verizon, CenturyLink. Uh, but they also, there are hundreds of these smaller private ISPs that are specialists in this area. Uh, and they, they also may be willing private partners depending on their business model. Recruiting large customers always helps build a business case. And you've got to have the community on board. So there does need to be a lot of public education as well. This can be done um, by surveying your community for potential subscribers and customers. Uh, all of that is, is what we see in other parts of the country when communities decide they want to pursue a community-led broadband system. So here's our last poll, and we are nearly at the end, folks. Um, wanted to just demonstrate to you the level of support that we know is out there in the public for community-led broadband. So get your phones out, last poll question. According to a March 2017 Pew Research Center survey, how many people support community-led broadband? All right, and it looks like most of you say 80%, and your instincts are right that it's, it's an overwhelming support by the public. The actual number was 70% in this particular survey. Uh, but like I said, your instincts are right. The community does overwhelmingly support this type of effort. So I think you would find there's pretty big payoff uh, from, from any kind of uh, investment of time and energy that you as a community leader would make for this type of effort. So lastly, we will encourage you, and you will be hearing more from the League about this uh, in, in the coming months and year, uh, to advocate for better public policy. And so this is really having conversations with state decision makers about changes, uh, making the case for changes to our state law that will clarify the law um, in the ways that we discussed earlier in this, in this presentation. So first off, describing the need in your community. Use data. Uh, numbers always help to tell the story. But at the same time, show what investments your community is already making to try to tackle this issue. Knowing what you need is very important. Um, I can tell you it's probably going to be pretty ineffective if all you do is pick up the phone and call a legislator and ask for some grant money. Uh, you, you need to have done a lot more work to identify those needs specifically in your community. So bringing all your community and private partners into policy discussions with you, um, you know, have them sit down with legislators and other state decision makers. Uh, don't have it just be local officials. Bring everybody to the table uh, to make the case. And also, at the same time, emphasize your experience as local government officials in building infrastructure. There is nothing different about this except it's a different type of infrastructure, but the same underlying public policy that, that made it good public policy for the public to take on big road projects and big water and sewer projects or electric or natural gas. Those policies are all present uh, in this discussion as well. So make sure to, to draw that connection. Finally, this is the last slide. Here are the resources that we suggest you turn to um, if you're just trying to get going and learn a little bit more about this issue. Here in the state, uh, the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office, or NC Bio, is a great resource. They have free technical assistance, they have toolkits, they have a mapping tool that's trying to get better data than what we have from the FCC. Uh, all of that can, can help tremendously as you're trying to get an effort for community-led broadband off the ground. There are some national groups as well. One is called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance that can provide really good data, case studies, and they've got tons of grassroots tools and handouts that local officials can use as they're building a local um, effort. They uh, have done a lot of work in North Carolina, actually. They're based in Minnesota, but have done a lot of work in North Carolina, and they are very familiar with our state 
Uh, and I think you would find them to be accessible and a really good resource. Um, certainly they put a lot of those resources online, so a lot of that's just available on their website. Finally, uh, CLIC and C, and CLIC stands for the Coalition for Local Internet Choice. Um, that's a national group with a, a North Carolina chapter, so CLIC NC is the North Carolina one. They're affiliated with Next Century City, and they can really serve as a connection with national experts uh, and help with issue briefs as well. All of these are tremendous resources. I can help connect you to them. My contact information is here on this slide. Uh, and so please take it down and feel free to reach out to me at any point and uh, I'll make sure to connect you with the resources that you're looking for. Um, but I really appreciate everybody's time today uh, with this presentation. Like I said, most of the content was drawn from our report, Leaping the Digital Divide, that we just released in March. And that report, if you would like to read it in full, it's available on the League's website, which is nclm.org backslash broadband. And we will also be putting the recording of this webinar up on that same website. And as we develop resources, they're all going to be housed there. So hopefully that's a, a website that you'll visit more in the future uh, and can refer back to it. So certainly this presentation and the recording of this webinar will be on there. Uh, that's it for the, the formal part of the presentation. I know it's been just about an hour, so want to be respectful of your time. But I see that there are some questions in the Q&A box. And so I'm going to turn to that right now. For those of you that want to stay on and hear me answer the Q&A questions, uh, please feel free to do so. They'll, they'll also be recorded here. I'm not stopping the recording. So uh, they, will, they will be um, available here. So we've got one question going back to small cell wireless. Can 5G be connected to an existing unused dark fiber? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, what would have to happen though for the antennas to work, for these small cell wireless facilities to work, is once they're connected to the dark fiber, it would need to be lit in some way to actually start feeding data, uh, either taking it from the antennas or feeding it up to the antennas. Uh, but that's absolutely possible. Let's see, how do we find where the MC-NC backbone, that middle mile backbone, is already installed? It uh, is available. I'm, I'm sure they've got maps, uh, GIS level maps of where it's installed. If you want to just get an overview of it though, if you go to their website, uh, they've got those maps featured pretty prominently on their website. And I think just a simple Google search for MCNC. Uh, the second part of this question from this person asked what that stands for. And I believe it's the microcomputing, I always get this wrong, microcomputer network of North Carolina. It is something like that. Uh, so you can tell the era in which that agency was formed back in 1982. We had microcomputers, and I'm sure they were enormous back then. Okay, got another great question. Is existing dark fiber able to handle gigabit service? Yes, and, and I think don't get hung up on this dark versus lit business. That just describes whether the service and, and the data is flowing through the fiber or not. Fiber itself is definitely designed to handle gigabit level data uh, transmission. And so, yes, it is, it is absolutely the way that that happens right now and will be in the future. Uh, and finally, just a, a point of clarification when we're talking about the law, this question asked, is an incorporated town in a county, the same as a city, for the purpose of the legal right? Um, and yes, in North Carolina, uh, Cities are, it doesn't matter what they call themselves, whether it's a town or a village or a city, they are all legally one entity and they're treated the same and they're called cities in our state law. So hopefully that was what that questioner was asking about. If there are any other questions, um, please feel free to type them in now. I am at the end of the questions that have been posed so far, uh, but I'll hang out for one more minute to see if any others come through. And if not, I'm not seeing any others right away. Oh, see, I knew. Once I ask, I always get more questions. Uh, somebody makes a comment saying, we also need to be able to use grants. And I would agree, that is absolutely true. Um, this is one of those areas where our state law is uh, gray. Um, there are lawyers who would say that local governments, whether they're cities or counties, are not available to use any kind of money, whether it comes from a grant source or otherwise, towards this purpose. 
There are some attorneys that disagree with that. And I think what we tell legislators is the fact that there is that grayness to the law, that you have that big of a disagreement, probably means it needs to be clarified. And that's the ask of the General Assembly uh, that we will, be, we will be promoting. So with that, I think we have come to the end of the questions. Like I said, you know uh, how to reach me individually, ewinia at nclm.org or at 919-961-6108. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks again, and we um, really appreciate your participation today. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.